And what we do, our platform is the switch, what we call the switch control inhibition. So thinking about what Dr. Henry mentioned a few months ago, so you will see to the left, that's where you have a protein that is in the inactive state. To in the middle, you see when the protein goes to the active state. So as you can see, it's going to change its 3D physical structure. So there's a tiny pocket that we call the switch pocket that you can see here. So when you are able to insert something there, you will not allow the protein to go to its active form, and that's why you will not allow the, the protein to keep going and keep going, allowing the cells to divide. So that's what our technology does. We, we are inserting drugs there. So now what we have in our pipeline, we have three compounds. This is E2618, which is a ketone, BGFR alpha, it's, it's also targets BGFR. So we are looking at GIS, that's our main indication, we are already in phase three. We are also looking at mastocytosis, uh, brain tumors, GBM. And we have two compounds that are in the pipeline that are in phase one and those escalation. Those are part of our immuno-oncology uh, portfolios. So those are gonna be targeting macrophages, which is something that is now evolving as a new way of attacking tumors. Um, going back to what Dr. Hargan already mentioned, I'm just gonna go rapidly to this slide. So in our phase one, we enrolled around 68 patients. I would recommend the phase two dose is 150 milligrams once a day. It's an oral drug. Uh, we enrolled already six expansion cohorts, close to 200 patients in one year. Uh, we're looking at patients in fourth line, patients who have seen uh, at least four lines, patients in second and third line, and then the other diseases that I mentioned that we are interested in. Uh, we explore doses from 20 milligrams to even 250 milligrams, milligrams once a day. Um, in terms of the seven number of patients that we have been rolling now as part of the expansion, 150 patients. If you see all the GIS patients that we enroll, uh, you see the different subtypes. So the majority of patients have a kit mutation. We have 5% of patients with a PGFR alpha. One patient was an SDH. Uh, that patient was enrolled at the beginning, but it's not what we were enrolling from the get go. Uh, around 20% of patients were enrolled in second line, 20% in third line and then 64% patients will have seen at least four lines of therapy. And you can see that the majority of our patients were enrolled in the expand 114 patients taking the dose that we are using for our phase three clinical trials. In terms of what we have seen as part of our versions, I think what's important to share with you what we are seeing so far. So in this slide, what we are seeing is all the toxic events that we they have been reported by the investigators in at least 10% of the patient population. So we are seeing alopecia, so patients are um, losing their hair. So the majority of these are grade one or two. I know that for some people this is important, but what we have learned is that patients who have been on treatment for quite a few months, they start to get the hair back while on treatment. So and we also work, what we have learned is that the texture of the hair is changing a bit. So we are seeing fatigue. I mean, this could relate or not to the study draw. Uh, the other thing that we have seen that is one of the most common is an increase in light base. This is uh, 10, 10, for example, 20% of patients, 10% grade one and two, grade three and four. At the beginning, we were a bit worried because light base usually is associated when the pancreas has some inflammation, but now we are we haven't seen cases of actually pancreatitis, so we know that this is not something that is only related to other drug, but it's related to other TKIs. So we're not worried, even if patients have an elevation of this uh, protein in the blood, we continue treating those patients, and eventually the, the, this protein will go down. So what we believe, and this is based on conversation with the investigators, is that the drug is very well tolerated. You would like to know more about uh, our campus, you can ask Dr. Henry, Dr. Trent, Dr. George Sumor, who's going to be here, because they have a, a lot of experience treating patients uh, with this compound. In terms of activity, Dr. Henrik uh, already showed something. So this is an update that we presented at ASCO this year. So you can see to the right, to the last column, this is looking at the different lines that the patients have received and the ways they are getting treatment with DCC 2618. So in the second line, we're seeing a response rate of 24%. So this is 
quite remarkable that we are even better than the, the current approved drug. In third language, in the same. And then in fourth language, we are as good as other compounds that are there. So 9%. So at the end, we have a 15% of response rate. So meaning that the drug is as good as all of the compounds that are currently approved for treatment of patients with GST. In terms of other ways of looking at the efficacy, this is an update of the data that Dr. Henrik mentioned. So to the left, you can see the waterfall plot. You see all of the patients who have the decreases in the, in the targets. And then here we see the, the tumors that are in between those, uh, these two lines are patients who, who are stable disease. And here you have the patients who have partial response. And uh, another way of looking at this is how the targets behave while on treatment. So you see that, again, uh, this is looking at a week on treatment. We have quite a few patients who have passed the six-month bar. And then you see these whole tumors that either keep going down or they are stable for a long time like this, and this aligns in red. Uh, other thing that we are doing at the site is that we are looking at cell free DNA. Um, this is a couple of examples that we have. So this, this, to the left, you can see that we're looking at patients who were in second line, third line, and fourth line. So each line is going to represent a patient. So for example, here this blue is a patient who was a second line, had a mutation in exon 9. But interestingly, well, there are quite a few patients who have, at the, uh, when we were able to detect this in the blood, mutations in different exons. So for example, here you see a patient who has, sorry, an exon 9 mutation, an exon 13 mutation, and an exon 14 mutation. And if we look at patients who are in fourth line, treated in fourth line, you see that actually there are patients who have an exon 11 here, then goes down to 13, 14, 17, and 18. So that's why we believe that for some patients, or the majority of patients that we have treated so far, you don't need a, a broader kit inhibition in order to really able to control that disease. And to the right, you see that we have seen cumulative reductions in the circulating mutation allele frequency of the, all the key exons, 9, 11, 13, 14, 17. So it's, a, it's sort of a waterfall plot in which you see all these nice reductions. So it, it, here is, is using a log scale, and you see that it's a number is minus one, is that there was a tenfold reduction in the mutation allele frequency. You see if it's a minus two, it's a 100-fold reduction. So in close to 80% of patients, we saw more than 50% of reduction of this um, um, mutation frequency. And 48% of the patients were kid negative on treatment with our compound. So uh, going to what we're doing as part of our phase three programs, as Dr. Henry mentioned, this is our first phase three clinical trial. It's called Invictus. This is looking at patients who have received at least three prior therapies. Uh, we have a two to one randomization. We are doing the trial against placebo. Who patients who are randomized actually have the opportunity Two to one to be to be able to receive active drug. Once uh, so we this is a blinded story. We have a central review of the CT scan. So we have a company, a vendor, who is looking at all the CT scans. So, so, so the sensors are sending the scans to this company. They make the evaluation and they is independently they decide if the patient has progressed or is getting benefit for treatment. If the patient has a disease progression that is confirmed by the by this is central review. Then the patient is unblinded and they can cross over. So if they were on placebo, they can go and get DCC 2618. If the patient was on DCC 2618, we allow the patient to go to a higher dose because at some point we were thinking like you might need this in the early stages to give a higher dose to see whether we can control the disease that way. Uh, so this trial is going to enroll around 120 patients. Uh, 80 patients on 2618, 40 patients on placebo, and as uh, Dr. Harman just mentioned, we are at least one third on the way with enrolling patients. Um, so these are the major inclusion criteria of the disease for adults, patients with GIST. Uh, they need to have progress for intolerance with imatinib, sonitinib, or regorafenib. Uh, we are asking for patients to have a performance status of zero or two. As you may know, zero means that the patient is perfectly doing well. As the performance of uh, number two is that patient is less than 50% of the time on bed. Uh, so if a patient has more than 50% of the, their time on bed, and they cannot perform the daily activities, they, they are not eligible for the clinical trial. Then we are also asking for the patient to provide archival tissue. Uh, 
uh, if uh, there is no tissue uh, since the last time that the patient was in treatment, we are asking for a tumor biopsy. And then um, do we have some exclusion criteria, but we have here that the user exclusion criteria that you will find in the clinical trials. Uh, so we are, uh, this is a global trial, so here the list of all the sites that are open in the US. Uh, we are working in Arizona, we have uh, three sites in California, we have major clinic here in Florida, we have Georgia, Illinois, and, um, and Boston, Minnesota. Uh, we have two sites in Minnesota. We have in New York, we have a couple of sites. We have Dr. Harry Corrigan, uh, Fox Chase in Philadelphia, and Texas. We are also working with a couple of institutions in Canada, and we're going to, we're actually opening right now several institutions in Europe, Belgium, France, Poland, Spain, and the UK. We have a couple of sites in uh, Asia, Australia, and Singapore. So, uh, so here is the information in terms of uh, that you can find online. So here are the incatrad.gov. Here is the identifier. This is the link to uh, where you can find information about the clinical trial. There's also a website that we have for Invictus, our phase three, that you can click in and see whether you know or you, if you would like to participate. Here we have all the inclusion exclusion criteria. And then we have here the contact information from the team at Decipher that will be more happy to take your call or an email if you have questions. So obviously we cannot give advice on treatment. We just we will uh, refer you to an institution where that is close to where you live. Uh, the other phase three, yes, I'm gonna finish. Uh, that we are thinking about opening in a couple of months is in three. So this is the trial in second line. This is a randomized trial versus sunitinib. Uh, we're looking at around 350 patients. As Dr. Hanna mentioned, we are uh, finalizing the protocol in the next few days. So hopefully we'll be able to open this trial by November here. We're looking at 175 patients, around 175 patients treated with 2618 versus 175 patients treated with sunitinib. And the primary point is progression free survival. And that's it. So thank you very much. I'm more happy to take your question. So we have another 15 minutes.